Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to uh, this session on complex PCI here at TCTAP uh, 2022. Um, we have a great session uh, planned today. My co-moderator, uh, my, my name is Fahim Jafri. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Singapore. My co-moderator is Dr. Gerald Warner, who really needs no inter introduction. He's one of the world's foremost interventionalists uh, in, based in Germany. We have an excellent panelist, uh, starting with Dr. Deepak uh, Amita, Dr. Kenichi Fuji, Dr. Eric Hong, and Dr. S Dr. Si Hoon Kong. Uh, each talk will be approximately six minutes, uh, following which uh, there'll be a, one or two questions and answers. We request the presenters to stay on time. Uh, so without any further ado, I will ask uh, Dr. Warner to introduce the uh, first speaker. We start with Dr. Lin. Uh, his presentation is on left main coronary artery stent deformity caused by a dilated sinus of Vasalba. Certainly an interesting case. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great honor to share our case. I have nothing to discuss. A 77-year-old male with a history of hypertension presented to our hospital with ever angina. ECG show uh, CRBBB. Uh, CR scan revealed the perfusion defect in apical anterior septal and the inferior wall. Chest as ray revealed a cardiomegaly and the tortuous aorta. We uh, engage a layman using a 0 5 diagnostic catheter. It seems no significant stenosis in LCA. But in this projection, you can see a critical stenosis in layman Austin. We have difficulty engaging RCA, so we did an Elta Guang, try to find RCA. You can see a very dilated LT root and a significant AR. Finally, we use an ALO2 diagnostic catheter uh, to do RCA angiogram. RCA was free of uh, significant stenosis. IBAS, IBAS um, show a small and overshaped lumen of lemon ostium without significant plague burden in other coronary segments. We perform PCI for lemon. We pre dilated lemon ostium and deploy a DES 4.0. And the optimal result uh, using uh, NC balloon post dilatation. This is a final angiogram, uh, an acceptable result. This is a post, I, uh, post PCI IVAS. Although the stand shift was not perfectly uh, wrong, the MSA could reach. 9.55 millimeter square, still a quite good result. The patient was discharged home on the next day with standard uh, medication. His symptom was uh, relieved much after PCI. However, three months later, he suffered from acute chest pain and visited our ER. ECG revealed a diffuse ST segment depression and the AVR ST elevation. Cardio enzyme were positive uh, for ACS. So we sent the patient to cast level for CAG. However, it was very difficult to engage a layman. Finally, um, EBU5 guiding catheter could engage layman. CAG revealed um, severe, severe layman instant risk stenosis. IVAS revealed a uh, overshaped stent configuration and some missing stent structure. 
still Ivas image was illustrated in panel A to panel D, showing a stand trial one missing over an arc of 180 degree, indicating stand fracture. In panel D, uh, you can see um, the stand protruded from the main with uh, Ivas proper outside the stand. Stand boost image uh, reveal, reveal the stand strut discontinuity, also indicating stand fracture. But why did the stand fracture happen? In chest CT, you can see a dilated LT root. The lemon strut, a lemon stand, was sandwiched between pulmonary artery and the uh, sinus of Basaba. We review IVAS 5A2 standing, uh, uh, show, showing lemon lumen change is lumen size uh, with half bit, compressed by sinus of Basava and the pulmonary artery. In Elta Guang, you can see uh, the dilated sinus of Basava push uh, the lemon colon artery upward to pulmonary artery. In summary, uh, the stand fracture was caused by Compression of dilated sinus of Basava. We repeated NG balloon, NC balloon dilatation for lemon ISR region, but could not get an, a satisfactory result. We have no choice but to consult a CBS doctor for surgical intervention. Finally, the patient underwent bandol procedure and the concomitant uh, cabbage with. Uh, uneventable post op cause. External compression of lemon colon, colon artery uh, is, is um, increasingly uh, recognized a disease entity, but mostly, uh, mostly in patients uh, with pulmonary hypertension and the dilated pulmonary artery. In our case, uh, the lemon colon artery was compressed by dilated sinus uh, of Basaba. Uh, an extremely rare condition. PCI with standing uh, should be avoided, uh, considering the high compression force generated by dilated sinus of Vasava. This may predispose the stand to deformation. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice educative case. I would have guessed that this is the outcome when we look at the IVUS because there was no atherosclerosis and it was sheer mechanical force uh, causing the compression. Do we have any comments from our panelists? I think, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon all. Uh, I think if, uh, uh, if there is no lesion in any other coronary artery and there is something which is very tight stenosis in any single segment of coronary artery, then one should suspect. And uh, that was also very clear with the, uh, that they have to take JL5 and EBU5 for the engagement. So I think a single uh, compression should, uh, one should look out for any external compression by the rest of the coronary arteries were free of the disease. That's my take on that. Yes, I think we don't have any stent that is really, uh, has force enough to keep a vessel open. It's the same when we have aberrant uh, artery between the pulmonary and the aortic root. So I think they're, we need to refer to the cardiovascular search. I think the other issue is that such a case should not be done ad hoc and should always be sort of stop and then discuss with the surgeons what the options are. Um, you know, you may end up still doing a PCI, but only after proper discussion uh, and planning, I think. And imaging as they have uh, obtained later. So thank you very much. And Fahim will introduce the next case. Right, so the next case is the, is the case of a thrombose giant uh, coronary artery aneurysm presenting with ventricular tachycardia by Dr. Mohamed Hannes, Mohamed from Malaysia. So, Dr. Mohamed, you're uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, I'm Dr. Hannes Hamidi uh, from Hospital University of Technology, Mara, Malaysia. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present my case today. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Thrombose Giant Coronary Artery Aneurysm. 
So without further ado, uh, the patient is a 65 years old man. He is a heavy smoker with diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, who is poorly compliant to medications and follow up. He presented with three hours history of palpitations and dizziness. He also complained of uh, heart failure symptoms for the past one month. Uh, in ED, his blood pressure was normal tensive with a heart rate of uh, 200 beats per minute. He was in a clear respiratory distress with oxygen saturation of 90% on high flow mask. So the initial 12 lead ECG showed a ventricular tachycardia. Patient was intubated and underwent electrical cardioversion. The ECG post cardioversion showed sinus rhythm with PVC and the presence of Q waves in the pathological Q waves in the inferior leads. The initial blood investigation showed normal electrolytes and thyroid level as expected in this man. His sugar and lipids were uncontrolled. Patient was being managed in the CCU with successful IV diuresis. He was managed to be extubated after four days. An echocardiogram was performed, which revealed a dilated left ventricle with poor LV systolic function of 21%. There were eight kinetic areas seen over the RCA distribution. However, on the apical four chamber and subcostal view, there is a presence of epicardial mass compressing the right atrial and ventricular wall. A cardiac MRI was performed subsequently to evaluate the pericardial mass and to determine the viability of myocardium before we proceed to any coronary catheterization. So the cardiac MRI was performed using multiplanar steady state free precession sequences and also a late gadolinium enhancement study protocol. As you can see in image A, there was a tubular mass just adjacent to the right atrial ventricular groove with internal heterogeneous signal measuring about 10 cm in length and about 5 cm in diameter. Well, basic anatomical knowledge related to the right atrial ventricular groove is the cause of the right coronary artery. At this point, we are already suspecting that this tubular mass might be a giant RCA aneurysm. Well, image B and C is just showing 100% transmural enhancement of the inferior cardiac wall in the late gadolinium study, indicating non-viable myocardium supplied by the RCA. So we proceed on with doing a diagnostic coronary angiography. So the first image is the RAO cranial view, which shows diffusely calcified ectatic proximal LAD and also a D1 disease with CTO at the mid LAD. The second image is the apicordial view, which uh, showed diffusely ectatic proximal left circumflex disease with CTO at the mid left circumflex with some anterior grade flow to the distal left circumflex. There was obvious calcified lesion at the point of total occlusion at the mid-left circumflex. The third image, however, showed a severely calcified ectatic proximal RCA with CTO at the proximal RCA. As there is no flow at all from the proximal RCA, there is still limited evidence to establish the diagnosis of RCA aneurysm for the right AV groove tubular mass. Therefore, we proceeded with a CT cardiac. CT cardiac triple rule out protocol was performed subsequently. If, as you can see in picture B, showed that the superior margin of the mass communicates with the proximal RCA. And picture C showed that the inferior margin of the mass communicates with the distal RCA, which is calcified and thrombosed. With this, the pattern of patchy calcifications on the peripheral rims of the mass is really suggestive that the mass is likely vascular in origin. With this information, the pericardial mass is indeed a thrombosed giant RCA aneurysm measuring about 5 cm in diameter and 10 cm in length. From the CT as well, showed another smaller mass with wall calcifications measuring about 2 cm which communicates with the proximal and distal left circumflex and indeed another thrombosed giant left circumflex aneurysm. 
Not only we have two giant thrombos coronary aneurysms, the cardiac CT triple rule out protocol also examines the iota where we discovered another large infrarenal fusiform abdominal aortic aneurysm. The triple A measures about 12 times 6 cm, which extends into the iliac bifurcation with presence of mural thrombus. Coronary artery with diameters greater than 4 times, the reference vessel diameter has been proposed as the definition for giant coronary aneurysm. Giant coronary aneurysm is rare with a reported incidence of 0.02%. Multiple giant coronary aneurysm is even more rare. In most cases, only single giant coronary aneurysm were reported. RCA is the commonest artery affected followed by LAD and the left main being the least affected. When multiple coronary arteries are affected, together with other vascular bed, in this case a AAA as well, systemic etiologies like autoimmune vasculitis and connective tissue disease needs to be considered. However, the age profile and presence of major atherosclerotic risk factors like diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking, hypertension makes atherosclerosis is the likely etiology for this patient aneurysms. Invasive coronary angiography remains the method of choice for diagnosis in evolution of coronary aneurysm. However, invasive angiography consists only of endoluminal view where in presence of intraluminal thrombus causing total occlusion like this case causes pitfall in the assessment of aneurysm. A CT coronary angiography can complement this pitfall by providing more accurate evaluation of the aneurysm size and its relationship to other surrounding structures. Degree can determine the degree of thrombus and classification of the aneurysms. Management of patients with coronary aneurysm is challenging as the natural history of coronary aneurysm is largely unknown. Most of current recommendations are just based on small case series. For this patient particularly, Resection of the giant thrombos coronary aneurysm with bypass grafting were discussed during the heart team meeting. However, the presence of concurrent AAA, poor LV systolic function, and a non viable RCA makes surgical option unsuitable. Patient is only treated with antiplatelet and anticoagulation with guideline directed medical therapy for the heart failure. So in conclusion, multimodality imaging approach is essential in diagnosis and management of a giant thrombosed coronary artery aneurysm. With that, I thank you for listening. Thank you. I mean, that, that's a fantastic, fascinating case. I mean, the patient presents for the first time with all this. Uh, it, it must be pretty, pretty rare. I'm going to ask a question to the panelist and to, to Gerald also. What do you do with this patient now? Do you do a CTO, a PCI of that LAD, um, you try to push for a mid-cap or you, you, you just put an ICD and kind of go home? Uh, what does the panelist think, the panel think? Maybe I, I answer yeah. first. Um, I don't think you can win a trophy here uh, by interfering with this patient. <laughs> just stay very, very conservative. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would probably lean towards putting an ICD, but the long-term outlook is pretty poor. I think, I think we would all, all agree with this. Uh, um, would you put him on long-term, lifelong anticoagulation? Is that the pl plan, Dr. Hannes? Or? Uh, yes, so far that is our plan to put on long-term, lifelong anticoagulation. And then we might revisit back, uh, I mean, the, uh, the decision for surgery because uh, I mean uh, in the meantime we are still optimizing the left ventricular systolic function with uh, guideline directed medical therapy. Um, on subsequent follow-up patient do recover well so that's uh, I mean that's a good uh, I mean he's pretty much ADL independent so okay. uh, yeah we might yeah we might consider I mean to discuss his case back during the heart team meeting. Well, great case. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I think, uh, Gerald, do you want to introduce the next speaker? We uh, asked Dr. Fang to mm -hmm. uh, start his presentation on chip revascularization with mechanical circulatory support. He's from Hong Kong, China. Hi, so it's my uh, pleasure to uh, represent my institution, Queen Mary Hospital Hong Kong, 
to present this case, um, uh, which uh, we did as a complex case. Uh, there was a CTO on the right and a cancer heart disease on the left requiring a phorectomy. The um, first operator of this procedure was uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Arthur Young. So this is case history. So this was an 81 year old man uh, who had a long-standing hypertension and pernicious anemia on B12 replacement. And he presented actually with a slip and fell fall, and he fractured his right hip. However, after hospitalization, he started to develop chest pain, and we found troponin elevation, um, mildly congested lung fields, and um, CG abnormality, um, SGT changes, as well as um, elevated um, um, enzyme uh, white cells, etc. And um, so we started the patient on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, low molecular heparin. We did an echocardiogram, the EF was only 30%. So we further did a functional study and uh, before, and then we sent the patient for uh, capitalization. So this was the ECG uh, showing uh, acid depression and tube inversion in uh, inferior leads as well as the lateral B456. And there was also ST elevation in AVR. Um, this is showing the displays, hip fracture, uh, chest X-ray. Um, and this was the peristernal long axis view and two chamber view. Um, so it's a basically global hypokinesia. And uh, the, the valium showed uh, multiple territory ischemia, um, including the um, apical um, inf and inferior segments, and, but there was a uh, viable myocardium in, in both of the segments, and basically all of the segments. That's right, so um, we took the patient to CAT lab, and this was the angiogram. RC or CTO uh, some, with some bridging collaterals. And this very calcified LED uh, with an uh, enrismal change uh, as well, the circumflex as well. So the first option for revascularization of this uh, patient was uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. So uh, we held a heart team meeting for this patient However, the surgeons commented that the patient was uh, too high risk owing to his current condition um, and also age. Um, this angiogram also shows uh, left to right collaterals. So I'll play it again. So we opted for a chip intervention. And because the EF was only 30%, uh, we, we applied for funding for uh, impaired supported uh, procedure. So we use uh, impaired CP for this patient. The setup was uh, Seven it was a 14 4 inch uh, access from um, uh, right uh, femoral access, and also a destination sheep inside the hair sheep, and pre close with uh, two proglide. And we use an AL 0.75 uh, to the right and contralateral injection through the radio with a JL for diagnostic. So we use anti grade Y escalation with a turnpike and also field X TAYM. However, uh, we couldn't puncture the proximal cap. So we escalated to a Gaia second, and we were able to negotiate through the CTO segment and exchange back to a red horse, uh, Sion Blue. Um, pardon me for the small images. And then we ballooned up the vessel for, with a 2-0 balloon, and then we did an IBIS. And for time concern, I will skip. So this was the pre-IVIS uh, result. So we further dilated the lesion with a 2-5 uh, scoring balloon and then proceeded to stand with, um, we chose a stance that uh, with data for one month DPT, so we use uh, Vessel onyx in this patient because there's potential need for hip surgery after we revascularize the patient. So we place um, three stands at 2538, 3026, and 3522 up to the ostium. And the showed um, satisfactory stand acquisition and expansion. However, we noted. Um, some uh, 
the slow stand edge dissection. So we added one more stand um, in this story, two old stand. Um, okay. So this completed the right side procedure. Then we move on to the left, uh, uh, same setting uh, with the impeller in. So we use um, a seven French XP 3.5 cavator for this. Um, and uh, Sion Blue Guide Wire. We intended to do image guided procedure. However, the IBIS could not cross. So we, we exchanged to a rotor pop V wire uh, to do a uh, rotation. Uh, we use a 1.5 burr, uh, eight passes, and then uh, 180,000, and then 1.75 for three passes uh, at 170,000 uh, rotations. And then exchange to um, um, recourse, and then we use a uh, further use of scoring balloon. And we proceeded to stand this uh, artery with a 275 stance and LAD, and also a 3534 in the left main into LAD. And then we, we post dilated up. Uh, we did a pot with four over a balloon uh, at 16 atmosphere. And then we um, did um, post dilate with a three O balloon, three five balloon at 16 atmosphere. Um, so these are the stancing images. Um, I can show you the post. Ibis images. So some, uh, actually some of those images were, were, were pre Ibis, sorry about it. This was so after the stanting. And we we are further optimized with the four uh, balloon, uh, NC balloon. So this was the image uh, afterwards for the LAD. So and then we closed the wound with um, uh, two percos uh, provide. Uh, we off the impeller and the same procedure. So the patient, uh, the ACS was stabilized. He was, however, because of the stenting, he was sent for rehab. And one month later, we evaluated for thinness for hip surgery. However, the after evaluation together with the uh, anesthesiology and the orthopedic surgeons, he was commented to be too high risk for the hip surgery. So eventually treated uh, conservatively, healed with uh, some uh, malunion, and uh, he was able to, uh, uh, he was um, on wheelchair and sent for further rehabilitation. But at least we were able to revascularize and treat his ACS. So for discussion, this would be, um, uh, the um, um, use of uh, impaired support for high-risk PCI. Um, so um, option here, for, we did both for the CTO and uh, also for calcified disease and uh, together with aphrectomy in the same setting. So I think uh, this would, wouldn't be uh, possible uh, without uh, mechanical circulatory support. Uh, during the procedure, at some of the time, the pulse pressure was very narrow. There's a, almost um, almost um, uh, flat line uh, totally depend on the impeller when we did the, the LAD uh, apparectomy. And other discussion point would be the um, uh, techniques for CTO integrate uh, wire escalation. And in summary, this is a case that um, there's some data showing the uh, protect to um, the uh, impeller um, showed um, uh, it, in, in the uh, intention of treatment analysis, there was no difference between IBP and impeller 2.5, but per protocol, there was a P0.048, uh, some, uh, some difference in 90 day maze. And in the uh, protect free, we show for a further decrease in maze uh, in uh, high risk uh, PCR supported by impeller. Uh, with the 2.5 and, and CP uh, impeller. So I think that's the end of my presentation.
Thank you very much. That was certainly a, a very good uh, case from the cardiological side. Unfortunately, the orthopedics uh, seem to be a little bit of the faint-hearted yeah, uh, because they didn't uh, actually do the hip surgery. Uh, but, it was uh, actually the in his physiology. It was um, the orthopedic surgeon wanted to do the hip surgery actually. So, uh, the situation intervention in this case is in the aspect of orthopedics, do we have to intervene the RCH to site and just uh, the P set for the LAD and uh, decrease the risk of uh, coronary disease can be enough for the conservative therapy for like hip fracture. How do you think about it? Um, excellent question. Uh, we thought about that uh, initially. Um, we do a, a LAD um, uh, to Lap into LED uh, um, PCI, but uh, since the inferior segment was also viable, so we we had a brief attempt for the CTO in the same session because uh, without uh, it is hard to have the impaired support. Um, so, so and actually the CT for the CTO intervention it was not uh, it did not um, take a lot a lot of time. So, so we were if we weren't able to. Uh, complete a CTO, we are happy to do the left main LED and then send the patient to uh, surgery. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Fahim will introduce the next. So, I think Dr. Cliff Lee is still try trying to uh, dealing with some technical problems. So, we'll go on to our next speaker uh, is Dr. Uh, Pyrrhus uh, from Thailand, who's going to talk about transcatheter septal closure of post MIVSD in a patient with an inferior wall MI and cardiac arrest on VA ECMO. Sounds like a fascinating case, uh, Dr. Pioros. Hello, my name is Biolot Lesson was in Chai from Ching Chalongan Memorial Hospital. It's a guest honor for me to speak here. This is a cat of 75 years old female with history of hypertension and dyslipidemia. She presented with typical chest pain for three days at General Hospital and EKG show inferior wall steamy. During waiting for primary PCI, she had cardiac arrest and returned osponalia circulation after CPI for three minutes. Emergent coronary angiogram at General Hospital showed total occlusion at mid-ICA and primary PCI was done at mid-ICA with TME threefold. Two hours after primary PCI, she had cardiac arrest. The EKG showed accessory and returned osponalia circulation after resuscitation. Trantrophic echocardiogram that was performed after cardiac arrest show a ventricular septal defect, site 12 millimeters at basal inferior septum with left to right shunt and good ejection fractions. Then ABP was inserted and referred to my hospitals. The first thing that we did after patient arrived at our hospital was initiation ward of VA ECMO to stabilize hemodynamics due to cardiogenic shock with multiple organ failure. We brought a case to the heart team conference for row of VSR closures. The surgeon would like to delay surgical closure for a week for better cognitive tissue formation allow the defect. But we were unlucky because at day eight after VA ECMO was initiated, patient has complications of VA ECMO, such as lower jet breathing, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. And she had ongoing cardiogenic shock. So we brought the case to the heart team conference again. So the surgeon has turned down surgical closures due to ongoing ischemic hepatitis and coagulopathy. So if this was your case, what would you do next? At that time, we plan to perform time carrier septal closures for intention to win off VA ECMO to decrease left to right shunt and to bid for surgery in the future if there was residual defect. For procedure planning, VA ECMO catheters were pressed in left femoral artery and vein, and ABP was pressed in right femoral artery. Then we decided to perform time catheter septal closures via right femoral artery and right femoral vein. So we remove ABP from right femoral artery. After we exchange ABP out from right femoral artery, we add one five French JR4 catheters via right femoral artery. Then we cross the defect from left ventricle to right ventricle with zero. 0 0.035 long tolumovi and landed tolumovi in the pulmonary artery. Then we advanced six fan 
multi-purpose candidate to pulmonary artery VRI femoral out vein. Then we insert that 15 millimeter jaw snare to multi-purpose candidate to snare the tromophile in the pulmonary artery and external light it via right femoral vein to form AV loop. Then we inserted 24 millimeter balloon sizing via right femoral vein to measure the VSR defect site. The VSR defect was about 20 millimeters. For device selections, the VSR defect and intervada septal thickness size were the important factors that we had to consider for device selection. In our case, the VSR defect was about 20 millimeters and the intervera septal thickness was about 10 millimeters. For VD culture device, the biggest size was smaller than our VSR defects. So we could not use VSD crochers to cross the device. The second one was PDA crochure device. The biggest size has aortic disc 26 millimeter in diameter and PA disc 18 millimeter in diameter. As you can see, the PA disc was not wide enough to cross the defect. Also, when the waist of elong the waist of device elongated along with the gross septal thickness, the thickness became shorter. So we cannot use PDA crochure device to cause the defect. In this case, we choose ASC crochure device size 24 millimeters to cross the defect because the waist was wide enough to seal the defect. And when the device elongated, the waist was decreased to about 20 millimeter in diameter and it could seal the defect perfectly. Also, LV disc and RV disc were wide enough to seal the defect. After we selected the proper device, we add one 12 French septal occluder sheet via live female way to load the device, but we couldn't add one the septal occluder sheet through the LV due to angulation of AV loop. So we add one six French multi port carrier via live female alley to support at one main of septal occluder sheet. At the end, we could add one 12 French septal occluder sheet to load the device. The LV disc of ASC crochure device was then delivered to LV, then we withdraw it toward the intervenous septum and deliver the LV disc. Before we release ocular device, we perform tiny social echocardiogram to confirm good septal alignment and device size. After duration by tiny social echo, the device was deployed from the delivery cable. Post VSI crochure, QPS decreased from 7 to 2.5. At day one after VSR crochure, we could win off all inotropic duct. And at day two, we could win off via ECMO. But unexpectedly, at four hours later after we off via ECMO, the patient developed kinetic shock and tantrosic echo show larger quality of dicraspid valve, causing acute severe TR that might occur during advancement of 12 French septal occluder sheet to load the device. We discussed with the family they deny the insertion of VA ECMO with dicuspid valve repair. So we perform balloon area septotomy to decrease RA and RV volume load. We add one SL2, SL0 introducer sheet, egg French real life femoral vein, and puncture the septum with BRK transeptal leader puncture under TE guidance. Then we pass Confida Y through LA and use Amanda balloon to perform balloon septostomy. After septotomy, Air pressure decreased from 24 to 22 millimeters mercury. After air septotomy, patient has ongoing cardiac shock and septic shock. Eventually, eventually patient die. What we learned from this case is VSR is a lab, but life threatening mechanical complication of a QMI. Temporarily mechanical support is a useful adjunct for hemodynamic stabilization improve an organ failure and bridge to VSR crochures. And percutaneous tankadal septal crochure is an emerging option for inoperable patients due to excessive surgical risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I mean, uh, it's a great presentation um, and uh, I mean, a heroic effort. Um, maybe I'll put it to the panel. I mean, uh, this is a 75 year old woman who gets um, uh, you know, has a acute MI, then develops a VSR, ventricular septal rupture, then gets V2A ECMO, then gets a VSD closure, and then get, gets a tricuspid closure. Um, is that going too far? Or, uh, you know, was it, 
a reasonable approach uh, in this patient? I think uh, what we have discussed with, uh, with many of the great operators that they usually wait for around two to uh, around two weeks, and the patient are usually on ECMO or usually on ECMO, and then they uh, prefer to go for surgical repair because I think in the initial phase there are a lot of uh, the tissues are very friable, and then they they get extended over uh, a lot of period of time, and uh, and uh, uh, there is one question regarding to this case that. Uh, this, there, there was severe TR in the in the PA pressures were very high, so I don't think so. It was because of this some sort of uh, some sort of rupture to the tricuspid valve apparatus. I don't think so because if it would have been there, it would be a primary MR, primary TR with with low PA pressures. It has it it was a severe severe PH, so I this might be having linked to some sort of uh, injuries on the left side, or uh, the patient might have. Uh, still some VSR going on or anything else, but I don't think so it is because of the, some uh, that injury to the trigger valve apparatus. What, what is my take on this? And uh, this all uh, devices in the LV, this all leads to uh, that uh, agglutinations also, and then there this RBC ruptures also, and then it, it also leads to a, a syndrome of uh, RBC breakdown, hemoglobin urea, and then AKI sepsis and shock. So this might be a cause for the death of the patient. This is what might take. This is a very, very good, uh, good comments. I mean, fascinating case. Uh, you know, it, in many hospital systems, this patient would have just been watched, and then if she survived, then surgery. Uh, and so it's always, you know, a difficult question. To, you know, how how conservative versus how aggressive. I think we'll stop here, and uh, Gerald, over to you for the next speaker. Yeah, just uh, one final comment. Uh, uh, this is a heroic procedure, and uh, of course, a surgical approach. I, I'm still coming from the age where we had surgeons, and we had more VS uh, ruptures uh, at that time because of uh, absence of uh, thrombolysis, even or intervention. So the cases are fortunately rare. But a surgical repair, of course, has a great risk if it's 50-50. But the case demonstrates it's uh, very complex, also interventional from the interventional side. So surgeons should accept even highest risk patients because technically it's the easier approach. But surgeons, sometimes they don't want to have patients dying on their tables. <laughs> they leave it to the cardiologist. We still uh, have the uh, presentation by Dr. Lee at the end of our sequence. Now we have valve in valve, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, in a patient with severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction in the previous Bentle procedure by Dr. Janurkar uh, from uh, Mangeshkar Hospital in India. Please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is valve in valve tower, transcatheter aortic valve replacement uh, in a patient with uh, severe LV systolic dysfunction in, in previous Bental procedure. Well, I do not have any potential conflict of interest to declare. Well, uh, this is 62 years old gentleman with known type uh, diabetes, two, type 2 diabetes mellitus and hypertension and a history of Bental procedure he had undergone in 2008 with 23 mm prosthesis uh, uh, with uh, porcine valve and a bovine uh, a pericardial conduit, which was a Bental procedure. Uh, and that was uh, way back in 2008. And he also had a history following that in 2012, he had endocarditis uh, uh, with some, some bacteria and uh, was treated for six weeks with antibiotics and he recovered well after that. Currently he has been in NYHA class three for last three months. Uh, hemodynamically stable though, ECG showed LVH with strain, echo showed severely increased transaortic gradients, that is severe aortic stenosis with uh, aortic regurgitation, with severe LV systolic dysfunction with ejection fraction of 25%. Surgeon declined redo procedure because he had large keloid on the chest as well as the adhesions inside and with high risk scenario as such. Well, clinical information wise, ECG showed uh, uh, LVH with strain, and on the right-hand panel, you can see that uh, uh, 
uh, increasing trans aortic gradients, 74 uh, systolic gradient and 46 mean uh, millimeter of mercury mean gradient. So that was severely uh, stenotic uh, prosthesis. Uh, 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 there were tests prior to catheterization. Uh, TE showed AV prosthesis with conduit in C2 with increased systolic gradients across it. Uh, moderate AR he had with a reduced systolic function 30%, uh, which, which was confirmed on transesophageal echo. Uh, CT angiography excluded uh, coronary artery disease. The annulus was 22 minimum and 22.9 maximum. The sinus of Valsalva was 25, 25, and maximum was 26 millimeter. Ascending aorta, the distance from prosthetic valve, the ascending aorta diameter was 28 millimeter. The distance bis between annulus and left coronary artery was uh, reasonably okay, 23 mm, and distance from the right coronary ostium was 30 mm. So that was uh, reasonably fine. Well, uh, these are three main show reconstruction images from CT, uh, uh, from CT scan, aortic root assessment. Uh, on the upper uh, panel, you can see annular size, LVOT on the right side, the inner and outer rim diameters we, we calculated very well with uh, three-mensure reconstruction. And also three-mensure reconstruction showed us that uh, the sinus height from the surgical processes uh, uh, left hand side upper panel, left coronary cusp, right, right coronary cusp and non coronary cusp on the right hand side. Then lower down, you can see there was some calcification on the prosthesis, uh, bioprosthesis, which was initially put uh, surgically. And the hockey puck uh, 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 image, you can see the, the angulation from from conduit that was bental conduit to the LV. So uh, we knew exactly how, how to advance uh, uh, the prosthetic valve, uh, the, the tower. Uh, uh, then uh, the stretched vessel diameter, you can see low down and also perpendicular plane uh, calcium quantification. So various uh, measurements we could get from three main show reconstruction from CT, uh, uh, CT scan. Here again, coronary artery assessment well showed us that uh, the coronaries were quite high from the annulus itself. And finally, we had iliofemoral artery assessment, various cross sections at uh, various levels, iliac femoral as well as descending aorta. So we exactly knew how, how, to, how to navigate our catheters through, through femoral artery into, uh, into descending aorta. And up. Well, the procedure was started with femoral access with perclosure uh, that was perclosed proglide uh, 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 suture mediated closure device by Abbott under general anesthesia and uh, and under TE guidance. Six French L1 catheter was passed through the valve delivery sheet over uh, J-tip guide wire and exchanged with straight tip wire and again exchanged with confida guide wire. So ultimately we had confida guide wire across the valve. The valve delivery system attempted to navigate the turn but failed here. We probably got into the perforation because of the uh, previous endocarditis which happened in 2012, way back. So we had to pass Lunderquist wire, Lunderquist wire again, uh, which is by Cook USA, also was utilized, which was acted as a buddy system. We already had confida wire through perforation probably inside left ventricle, and but uh, we couldn't negotiate the bend and we couldn't advance the valve. So we had to use Lunderquist and both the wires uh, a particular point in time were inside left ventricle, so which acted actually as a body system to navigate and to advance the valve across the surgical prosthesis. Well, we chose here self-expandable valve Evolute R26 mm, uh, which was implanted under rapid ventricular pacing, obviously, using the standard technique via 14 French femoral sheath. And we had to follow it by post dilatation using 23 millimeter true dilatation balloon of Medtronic. And uh, because initially the gradient was a little higher and then TE confirmed the accurate positioning of the, of the valve and we dilated with 23 mm balloon and we, we got uh, optimal hemodynamics TE confirmed that albeit little later, the gradient fell down to mean of six millimeter of mercury from initial initial uh, 15 millimeter of mercury. No complications observed during or after the procedure. Device site closure was done with angio seal finally and TE repeated after three days showed good function of valve uh, with with a uh, uh, mean gradient of six millimeter mercury, no paravalvular leak, and uh, patient was uh, up and about and quite okay and discharged after, after uh, 72 hours and uh, followed up after two weeks. So here exactly on the left-hand side panel, you can see the positioning of the valve under TE guidance, rapid ventricular pacing. 
So I'm positioning it properly there. The, the lunder twist wire is seen in left ventricle. And on the right-hand panel, we dilated with the balloon, true dilatation balloon catheter system and, and achieved the proper, proper gradient, uh, what we wanted. So here, immediately post-deployment and post-dilatation, we could see the mean gradient came down to 16 and six millimeter of mercury. Well, uh, I'm coming to the end now. The, the points to ponder upon discussion-wise, uh, was it high risk subset? Uh, what could be the choice of valve here, uh, looking at the scenario? and the challenges we faced and the post dilatation strategy every every uh, self expanding valve needs or not so high risk subset yes definitely previously bental surgery was done so it's a plastic tube all all across the ascending aorta uh, patient had uh, infective endocarditis so some perforations here and there in the in the porcine valve which was put surgically patient had severe lv dysfunction which was 25% ef uh, it was high risk redo definitely uh, euro score was 35.7 so that you know uh, the surgeons were shy shying away from the from the procedure itself uh, redo procedure and obviously there were adhesions inside and huge keloid patient had on the chest so surgeon declined and patient also did not want uh, surgical procedure again so he was in search of tower uh, uh, the choice of valve initially we thought of balloon expandable uh, expandable valve but uh, you know looking at the bulky delivery system rather than uh, that we chose self-expanding valve because we had to navigate through a plastic tube of, uh, you know, conduit uh, of bental, previous bental surgery. Uh, uh, so challenges were navigation, definitely because of the bental, uh, bental tube itself. Uh, deployment, of, uh, deployment of the valve, uh, you know, at the position was little uh, challenging because there was absence of severe calcification, what we now, uh, obviously see in most of the cases of aortic stenosis here, there was aortic regurgitation also. So lack of visibility was a problem. The anchoring of processes because of la lack of calcification was also a problem. So deployment had, you know, we faced little challenges uh, uh, while deploying. Uh, coronary ostia no, was not a great deal here because they were quite high up. So coronary blockages was, uh, I mean, it was a rare chance in this, this particular procedure. AOT regurgitation uh, again posed a challenge. Post dilatation strategy, you have to sometime dilate the valve, even if it is self-expanding valve, uh, to achieve the proper gradient, and there is no harm in doing that. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the final uh, conclusion take home message is, it is first Asian valve in valve procedure to the best of our knowledge performed in previously done bental surgery with history of endocarditis and severe LV dysfunction of ejection fraction of 25%. It demonstrated this particular procedure demonstrated feasibility of tower with self expanding valve uh, here metonic evolute uh, 26 in setting of degenerated perforated processes because of prior bacterial endocarditis. Challenges were absence of landmarks, as I already alluded to, absence of cal more major calcification, and it was all stentless conduit. Rather, it was porcine valve, surgical valve with conduit with bovine pericardium. So it was no, there was no biocompatible material to negotiate with. It was all fully biological conduit. So you know, it was rather difficult for us to navigate through that conduit uh, into the into the annulus. Uh, Confida with Lunderquist wire here uh, acted as a body system. You know, uh, we we past confida wire probably to the perforation, but at the same time, we put both the wires in left ventricle and then we push the, push the processes uh, across the conduit, across the ventral system. So it was better to, uh, you know, in order to navigate the turn of conduit, it proved to be a good, good uh, uh, thing as a body system. Well, accurate planning, CT scan, uh, three-menu measurements uh, from CT scan, uh, through particular software from Core Lab, were crucial to choose correct valve and to determine the position of reimplanted coronary ostia, which was not a major problem here because they were high in this case, mitigating the risk of coronary occlusion. Post dilatation was essential in this case to achieve optimal result. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. The nice case, impressive, and of course our. Topic complex PCI goes now well beyond PCI. It's complex percutaneous intervention. And that was a very nice example of it. Thank you. Any comments uh, from the panelists? How about the heart failure status after the tower procedure? Was it improved? You said the patient had a heart failure ejection fraction was about oh, yes. 20%. Yeah. Yes. Was it improved after the yes. tower procedure? Yes. No. 
yeah now it's almost six months follow up and uh, it happened last week and the ejection fraction is almost normal 55 to 60 percent we're almost negligible gradient across the valve which is acceptable and patient is doing very well without any symptoms if there are no more um, further comments uh, we'll try the last talk thank you very much thank you yes so i i'll uh, introduce our, our last speaker dr cliff lee from singapore is going to be uh, presenting a case of an unexpected accordion to burr and not to burr. Uh, Cliff, over to you. The title of my presentation is Unexpected Accordion to Burr or Not to Burr. I have no potential conflicts of interest. This patient is a 52-year-old male, smoker, family history of sudden cardiac death, with two week history of chest pain and a raised troponin. ECG was unremarkable. Impression was n STEMI and an echo shows EF of 35%. We proceeded with a coronary angiogram. The angiogram shows a tight mid LED lesion that is calcified. The mid circumflex was a very tight 90% lesion and the RCA was heavily calcified and very tortuous as well. So given the heavily calcified and severe triple vessel disease, the options of bypass versus multivessel PCI was discussed with the patient, but he declined to bypass. So we proceeded on with PCI to LED and CERT followed by PCI to the RCA in a stitch procedure. PCI to the left CERT was done with a drug coated balloon, a 2520mm with residual stenosis of less than 30%. LED was also treated with um, obvious guided orbital arthrectomy and a drug coated balloon to the mid LED with a 3520mm was done with very good results and residual stenosis of less than 30%. Stage PCI to the RCA three days later, and because it was such a heavily calcified lesion, we decided that we will need calci calcium modification during the procedure. We were planning to use a rota rotational arthrectomy with a 125mm burr due to the severe tortuosity in the mid-RCA. Over here, you can appreciate the calcium in the mid-RCA and also the severe tortuosity, especially in the RAO view. We first used the IL-35 guider, but we were unable to track down a 1.5mm balloon, hence we changed out to the AL-0.75 guider and using a Sion and Sion Blue ES guide wire as body wire technique, and, but we were still unable to track down a 1.5mm balloon in the mid-RCA. So we decided that we'll probably proceed on with arthrectomy and using a cost at Pro-X as my catheter to advance distally just before we were about to exchange out the wire for a rota wire, a test shot noted a very severe mid-RCA lesion. Was it a spiral dissection? Or was it a spasm? Or was it a cordon phenomenon? So we decided to stop and not proceed on with rotational arthrectomy given this appearance and we exchanged it out with a wiggle guard wire. We were fairly certain that this is not a spiral dissection and more likely a cordial phenomenon, and hence we used a semi-compliant 1.5, then an NC score flex 175 balloon to pre-dilate the proximal and mid-RCA. Then using a guide extension, we used the NC20 balloon to dilate it up further. Now, we were able to use a Ivers catheter to study the RCA. So over here, you can see a very heavily calcified and 360 arcs of calcium inside the mid-RCA. And just over here, you can see that there is an accordion phenomenon. So there's a concentric ring of calcium and also the accordion phenomenon as observed on the IVUS. So in view of the heavy calcium burden and accordion, we decided against using rotational arthrectomy because of the higher risk of perforation. We changed our strategy to IVR shockwave therapy instead and proceeded to use a 35 times 12 mm balloon. After delivering 80 pulses to the mid RCA, we, this is the repeat run, which shows a lot of cracks in the calcium, and the calcium looks like it's been modified with cracks of the 360 rings of calcium. So over here, you can see the cracks in the rings of calcium. And also the accordion phenomenon is still observed, but there was still a proximal RC ring of calcium over here. 
So this is an angiographic results after the IVL therapy, which shows pretty good angiographic um, expansion actually. And then we use the cutting balloon, the 3015 mm, to dilate it further. So a drug eluding stent, a 3548 mm, was used to place from proximal to distal RCA. So this was deployed, and we post dilated it with a 40 NC balloon. Now, Ivers run subsequently shows pretty good results with good stand edge plug burden, although the mid RC stand was slightly asymmetrical in expansion and has a slightly smaller MSA. But we decided not to pursue this further because of the risk of perforation since we have already used 4-0 NC balloon to post dilate to our high pressures at up to 22 atmosphere. So these are final angiographic results which shows very good angiographic um, expansion of the stent and no stent edge dissections. These are the final angiographic results of the RCA. In this case, angiogram after wiring RCA was worrying for spiral dissection or basal spasm or accordion phenomenon. Intracoronary imaging was able to help us identify the correct diagnosis. We chose our IVUS in this case over OCT because there was no need for anti-grade injection. In heavily calcified and tortuous coronary lesions with accordion phenomenon, what would your strategy be? We opted to use a wiggle guard wire with a guide extension and good pre-dilation with an NC and cutting balloon followed by IVL therapy. Conclusion, it is important to strategize and have pre-planning for high-risk PCI and it's even more important to change plans when situation changes and be flexible. Be aware that accordion phenomenon can happen in tortuous vessels and there is a high risk for arthrectomy. Can consider IVL therapy in calcified lesions. The importance of intravascular imaging to guide PCI in calcified lesions in pre-PCI planning, intra-PCI assessment, and post-PCI evaluation as well. Thank you. That's a great case, Cliff. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Gerald to lead the questions. Uh, Cliff is from my institution. So uh, how, okay. about, uh, how about you, know, you can bounce some questions off him? Yeah. Well, the case certainly was uh, well planned. Uh, all devices used that we can think of. Uh, especially, I, I, I found also with the other cases that obviously in Asia, um, cutting balloons seem to be very popular uh, in the absence, absence of any really good clinical data, but very popular. Uh, I think... Uh, we asked the panelists, uh, are there any comments on this approach? Would they have gone with the rotoplation as originally planned, despite the angiographic appearance? Dr. Fuji, would you have gone mm -hmm. for rotoplation? No, I don't think so. If I look at the angiogram, it's, uh, it's not a good idea to try the, the rotoplation, but uh, but. They, but he used uh, the cutting balloon, which is also uh, some kind of dangerous, but nothing happened after the cutting balloon. So, so nobody knows if he used a uh, low tubulation, what happened, it's really difficult. But when we look at an angiogram, uh, this patient could have the, some chance of the coronary perforation. That's why we should not use the low tubulation first. We should try the balloon first, in this case. But Dr. Fuji, maybe I put the, the counter question. What about rota regret? Once you dilate and you dissect, then you cannot rotablate. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with that uh, problem of a really calcified vessel that needs modification? Mm, yeah, that's, re that's really difficult. So in this case, we normally use the intravascular imaging like uh, IVIS and OCT and look at the, the, where the wire position that uh, also make sure the the angiogram. Uh, I think I, I guess it is much better. And if we see the uh, the like the, the wire is uh, is attached to the vessel wall, which is dissected, I think it's a uh, it's a kind of dangerous to do the rotobration. But the wire is not attached to, to the dissected wall, so we could do the uh, rotobration. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we need to wrap up this uh, very interesting session of uh, six challenging cases from 
the area of not only complex PCI, but um, beyond. And I think we all learned some very spectacular anomalies uh, and take something home. I think the speakers, the panelists, my co-moderator, Fahim, and uh, hope that also our audience enjoyed the cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.